Um, yeah, and thank you for the uh, brief introduction. So, yeah, this is the, this is the book I'm going to be um, talking about. Obviously, I would hope that it's not in the library because of all the sort of flood, you know, students and stuff that will be with one of them at the moment. But, uh, um, yeah, so this, this is a quite a long, you know, period of work. It sort of encapsulated quite a few projects and stuff that I've done over the years. Um, and it was, it was a project which is kind of somewhere between a coffee table and a technical book. So that's kind of going to be the, the pitch of my uh, talk this evening. And uh, I'm not going to talk you through all of it because that will take quite a long time. It is about you know, 400 pages long. I'm just going to touch upon a kind of some of the interesting parts of it and stuff. Uh, and, and sort of really kind of try and, um, I guess, um, show you what's interesting and exciting about working with water. Um, what's the pointing? So, uh, well, why aquitecture? Um, I know it's actually now a subject that a lot of people are doing uh, in different universities because, you know, I sort of see it popping up from um, CVs and stuff people who send in and suddenly flooding is this, this kind of this, this big thing that everyone's uh, engaged in and stuff and, and rightly so because actually uh, over the last, what, um, 15 years or so that I've kind of been involved in, in water architecture work, there's been a lot of floods, you know, and it's only going to carry on, it's only going to get worse, there's only going to be more of them. Um, and, and we are totally unprepared for it. You know, we've got some sort of flood defences and such things like that, but they're all designed to kind of historic uh, standards. You know, we all kind of work on the basis of, of our kind of understanding, which came from, well, from me, from sort of penguin geography books, um, you know, where, where we all knew what, how everything worked and, you know, nothing was ever going to change, um, you know, or from sort of Winnie the Pooh or various other things that you, stories about flooding and stuff and of course that has all changed even now you know we're seeing things where it's, it's not you know people are, it's beyond people's predictions you know, even where Jessica and I live at the moment you know we bought our place um, and we actually had the foresight to go oh well, this looks like it might flood at some point and now it's actually in flood plains so, so we've put, thankfully sort of designed measures to try and tackle it before we actually built our new house so um, you know, my driver was when I first set up um, um, Backer with my um, old business partner, was looking at kind of what are we going to do, uh, what are we going to leave as a legacy for the work that we fit, you know, do at the end of our careers. It would be pretty disappointing to do all this work over, you know, I don't know, five, ten years before you retire early, or, or maybe not, maybe a bit later than that. But, you know, to look back at your career and go, oh, my God, I got it all wrong. You know, and I've just, I've, I've balls it all up. I've left people with this bloody awful situation and they're all going to suffer from flooding and overheating and all sorts of stuff. Um, so you thought, we thought, yeah, we've got to try and do something right about this. And we started looking at, you know, how to integrate environmental measures and, you know, all the sustainability that probably people are pretty used to now. Um, and we soon sort of thought, well, it's all well and good, but actually this, this flood risk is not already being addressed at the moment. This is pretty serious, you know. Um, if, if something floods, I mean, you know, you, your whole property could be kind of destroyed by it, written off from it and stuff. And actually, all these kind of lovely environmental measures you put in are pretty redundant. So we thought we, we ought to have a look at it and try and work out what we can do. And before we knew it, it kind of become quite all embracing. Um, that's a good slide. So, you know, th this is our future. Waltham Stone Marshes, maybe, you know, in a few years' time when it all dries up. Um, yeah, you know, maybe this is a, a view of the kind of, well, you've seen all these pictures of climate change and stuff, melting ice caps and stuff, but it's, it's, it's actually part of our natural cycle and flow of the world. We just had a lovely static period for a period of time, and now we've got to deal with this change. And that's kind of, you know, good and bad. Change is interesting. You know, dynamic architecture, maybe that's quite, quite fun. Maybe changing you know, buildings that move and stuff. You know, I remember reading about Archigram and having whole buildings move and cities move and stuff. Maybe not so stupid anymore. Um, but it does come pose a few challenges. But it's not a new thing either. You know, this is the, this is the classic one that we all know about, the, you know, Noah's Ark. Um, in fact, funny enough, my, my college project was actually called The Ark, because I thought it was quite a good um, precedent for this sort of thing uh, to go forward. But, but actually, I, I often use the, the phrase, the biblical flood, because people say, oh, I'm not in the floodplain, or it's, it's, it's fine, I'll be okay, you know, or... You know, this is the, 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 the peak level and stuff. I said, yeah, but imagine you had a biblical flood. What would happen then? What, you know, what, where are you going to go? What's going to happen to your building? Um, and so you know, that's why I wanted to talk about uh, aquitecture. So 
So as I said, it's all about geography. So having, you know, you spend all your time drawing buildings and stuff, and then you suddenly realize that when you're dealing with water, it's actually not just about the building. In fact, it's not even just the grounds that the building are in. It's not even the city the building's in. It's actually beyond that. It's actually, the, 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 certainly in terms of flooding, it's the whole catchment. And that's actually quite exciting because architects are normally pretty notorious for wanting to kind of extend the red line boundary of their site anyway and probably think they can design everything. So but when you do the flooding, you kind of have to think about everything. So you know, that's quite kind of fun. And so when you look at a kind of whole catchment, you realize it's all interlinked. So in, in the uh, upper parts of the catchment, this is the sort of top section here. You know, we've got the, the highlands and we've got you know, potentially dams and you know, mountains where the water flow, there's areas being caught, <coughs> and rivers start to build up, connect together. Uh, there's accumulation of flows as they grow into bigger rivers before they kind of extend down um, through the middle catchment part of it where you know, a lot of settlements are, uh, are built. And then through to the kind of lower catchment where it kind of opens out into the sea and connects uh, you know, with the wider water system before it all kind of evaporates and goes back up into the this, this system and, and uh, percolates back down again. And so, and, and you know, realize that actually if you look at this, this old geography diagram, and look at this upper, middle, and lower catchments, there's some really interesting things. Because you, you realize that actually, depending on where you are, you might have a different solution. You know, it's not just are you at risk of flooding or not. You're all part of this catchment. Every single person, every single project, you're all part of the, 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 the rainwater catchment. You're all part of the floodplain. So if people say, oh, I'm doing a project to do with flooding, and I'm not. No, you're all doing it. It's just some of you are paying a bit more attention to it. So I'm sort of trying to say you should all pay attention to it a little bit. And of course, again, you know, this is not something that should, which is new. Um, we could have picked anything Roman, to be honest with you. They're pretty good with water. Uh, they, they, they Arguably, other people invented it, but they recognized as sort of inventing the sewage system. And then it took us, what, another 1,500 years or something to reinvent it when we you know, forgot how to do it. But um, you know, they, they invented the sewage system. They invented um, aqueducts to sort of draw water into the, uh, into the town, you know, from seven hills around Rome, for example, and then extend it across in, in, into other parts of, the, of, the, uh, of, of Europe. And they also, um, which I didn't know until I actually went to Rome, they also brought about sort of drainage systems so they could build on the floodplain. And most of the forum is actually built on marshland in Rome. So they drained it, built the sewers to drain it so they could actually develop on it. So they were the first floodplain or, you know, really kind of recognizable floodplain developers. But, you know, you could pick the Egyptians. They were pretty good at it. Um, this is another Roman example where they, they didn't have enough water and they built this, this settlement in the middle of uh, the desert. It's actually below sea level, but about 180 meters above the adjacent ground because it's right next to the Dead Sea. Uh, and here they did develop this kind of amazing um, system to kind of channel water from all around the hills. And so it's catching up here. You can actually just see the traces of it here before it all cascades back down into these underwater systems and stuff before they carry it up a donkey up into the top and they could you know, sustain their water-rich life that they all enjoy. Um, and then this is the Kaima Rouge um, in uh, Angkor Wat where they actually developed this huge kind of array of uh, what they call barrays, which are like big kind of retention areas and stuff that they could use to manage their crops, grow um, more, more food for their, their soldiers and things so they could actually go and invade other areas and stuff. And it all became intricate, intricately linked into their, their society. And there's modern architectural examples of it as well. So you know, this is Carlo Scarpa's... Um, uh, palace in Venice where you know he's in, sort of embraced the water flowing in and out of the building and articulated it. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is going to come up a little bit later as well. This would never be allowed now though, of course because it's an amazing seminal building and you know it is, it is quite quite beautiful um, but of course what he did is he built right on top of a river <laughs> which is a total <laughs> faux pas because effectively it means that he's sort of restricting all the natural flow of the water and if it goes into flood it's going to hit this wall and of divert off and it's going to cause problems elsewhere and stuff but it does does look pretty cool so so he's you know probably didn't do his flood homework before he did this project so, but uh maybe that was a fortunate thing and he did it in his, in his time so understanding water is, is kind of the first step in trying to to deal with it um, probably as much as anything you know and it's a really tr tricky one to to sort of gauge because if you imagine if you're like a homeowner and 
you've got to deal with a flood. You don't really care whether the water comes from your bath overflowing or whether it comes in from the, uh, you know, the, the river overtopping or that you know, your, your drains are blocked or something. It's just a pretty miserable thing to have happen. But actually, in terms of, you know, as a sort of designer, understanding it is quite important because as a, you have a sort of different solution depending on where you are. And I often see in these sort of you know, projects people are working on, they say, okay, well, you know, we've got this, this, this flood risk to work with, so we're going to create a storage area. And I said, well, where is it? Said, on the coast. So it's a tide. So how much are you going to store? Are you going to store the Atlantic, or are you going to store the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and the, and the Pacific? You know, it's not going to happen. Storage doesn't work on the coast. You know, it's a stupid idea. So, but, you know, and in the river, you know, how big's the river? How much, how much of the river are you going to store? How long is it going to flow for? How long is the water going to be st stood there on your ground? You know, when we had our site flooded in, in, um, in Marlow, it was there for, for three months. You know, you weren't going to store it. You just have to deal with it and get over it. So understanding these things is, is really interest, is really important. So these are the kind of key uh, flood risk um, issues you have to deal with. So um, and this one's probably the one everyone really knows. It's like if you buy a river, yeah, you might well have a bit of flood risk to deal with. So fluvial flooding is the, the first one. Another one, coastal, we see this quite often, and this is from Hurricane Ike, but hurricanes are always a kind of classic example where the water's risen up and kind of flown across the land and caused no end of devastation. But this is the one that started to catch people out now. This is the one that um, people are just sort of starting to understand. And this is the one that, that we, f we found when we bought our site. And we went, oh, it looks a bit low here, and the ground's all around us. Maybe it's going to pond here. It's, um, it's basically water that, that just collects. It runs off when you get a, have a big storm. Can't go into the drains, can't percolate into the ground quickly enough, and just builds up. And you end up with these, these various ponding areas and stuff. And they've redrawn all the flood maps in the uh, UK to try and... Uh, sort of understand this uh, uh, better. And then these are the, the, the less frequent ones, but equally you know, very important. Sewage um, flooding, pretty much linked to this one. If your water goes, if your rainwater runs off into your sewage system and your sewage system isn't designed to cope with it, it just overflows. Um, Tem the Thames Water have just sort of invested in this, or starting to invest in this huge super sewer to try and cope with it. The, this is partly because it will help to answer this problem, but equally because uh, it's the only way in which they can raise their, uh, uh, their bills with all of its uh, customers, whereas if they put in green measures to try and deal with it, they couldn't. So, you know, it's a different matter. Um, and then groundwater, which is basically where the water starts to percolate up through the ground. And that's a real, real bugger if you don't sort of, you know, you're not going to see that one coming because you're not, you might not be near a river, you might not be the, near the coast, you know, you're not at risk of a, you know, surface water, but you, you might be on quite a low-lying bit of land or it's quite flat, and the water will just percolate up when there's a really big rainstorm, and then you're stuck with it. And so all these lovely ideas about kind of floating homes or, you know, protection measures and stuff, you just you know, aren't necessarily going to work because you haven't foreseen it. And then the final one, which is quite hard, thankfully, to find examples of is infrastructure fail failure. So this is where you might be living next to a big kind of reservoir or dam or, or even by a canal or something. There's a big body of water stored in that. And if that went, if that collapsed, then of course, you know, you're going to get a kind of rush of water kind of flowing through. And it does happen, unfortunately. And that's, that's pretty devastating. So in the book, we, um, we, this is sort of taking various different guidance and stuff. So the one on the right is actually guidance from the government about what you can put where, um, looking at that and integrating that with, with ideas of what a flood risk actually is. The kind of thing about risk is it's, you know, it, it's like the argument that uh, if a tree falls in the wood, you know, does it make any sound? And it's the same with water. Um, you know, if, if you have a, um, a, a, a massive flood event, but it doesn't affect anybody, it doesn't you know, no, there's no real kind of massive consequence to it. You know, if it's in a remote wilderness area, it doesn't really matter. It's the same sort of principle. But if you've got a big flood and you've got a lot of people living there, you know, maybe if you've got elderly people or people who are asleep or something like that, then it's, then it's a big impact on it. So you can actually design town, cities and stuff thinking about who goes where. Uh, and it's a good, good approach to dealing with it. So that's why you know, sometimes say risk is a, is, is a factor of probability and consequence. So what's the probability of flooding if it's, if it's very high and it happens frequently? Um, you know, that's going to have a higher, higher risk, but if it's infrequent, but it's a big flood event and it has a big consequence, that's going to have a higher risk as well. 
there's plenty of information on these things, flood maps, you know, it makes for a nice kind of diagram and, uh, you know, picture for a presentation and stuff like that. They've now got them all different colours and stuff. You can all get them with tone and gradients and stuff on them the, these days as well. This is uh, one just off the Environment Agency's website. It shows you the flood risk on a site that we're working with. Generally, blue is bad. Well, unless you, you know, want to use the water. Uh, kind of used to having normally sites which are like there, though, so this is sort of not unfamiliar territory. Um, and then whereas the rest of the area, white, still in the flood zone, by the way, still in flood zone one here, so but you're much less likely to flood than anywhere else. But then they brought out these other maps. So uh, this is a um, infrastructure failure. So there's some dams up here. So if they fail, you're gonna have quite a big area flooded. Then they brought out uh, surface water flooding as well. So different areas can flood from that. Uh, and then also uh, groundwater flooding. And so you kind of have to think about all of these different things. Um, you know, always sort of try and overlay them. I don't know what's going on there. Um, so the book is structured uh, really effectively in four different areas. It's got a bit kind of haywire here, but anyway. Um, planning, engineering, landscape, and building. We sort of prosaically called them waterfront planning, integrated architecture, you know, in water infrastructure, hydroscapes, and aquatecture, but it, that's kind of what it is. You know, so, um, but it's, 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 what's really important about it is they said, but this is what we normally do. You know, we're architects, we do buildings, and that's, that's what we're focused on, you know. Oh, if we're, We've been a bit kind of crazy. We might focus on doing the landscape and look at what's going around it. We integrate, put some hills over it and cut into the ground and all that sort of stuff. Don't normally do this part. That's a bit boring. Engineering side of stuff. Uh, I don't know. Someone else deals with that. Actually, there's some fantastic, you know, examples of, of our engineering with water. And I, when you realise it, and you start looking at it, and you think, oh god, they get to do all the bridges and they do all the, all the, um, uh, you, you know, the. the pipework systems and the roadways and all these things you go they're really good they're really interesting they're big projects you know have such a big impact on this stuff why can't we ever get that as well and so with the with a bit of architecture you can and of course planning you know we do get involved in a bit of planning master planning and stuff generally not very good at it because we always like to make you know loads of really special buildings so it looks like um, trump town or something like that where you've all got a bit carried away and it's like one of everything in there and stuff but actually, just the way in which we plan and lay things out and how we locate different buildings in different spaces is really important. And you know, when I see, again, you know, you know, students and stuff, and they've gone, oh, yeah, we're going to put a care home by the water because it's nice for them to look at. Yeah, seems like quite a good idea. You put in the most vulnerable people in the highest level of risk. Is that a good idea? Maybe something else should go there. Maybe they should go somewhere else. Or maybe with a bit of cross-programming, you know, we could say, well, we're going to put like a cinema down there or a theatre down there and the old people can live on the upper part or something like that and we'll create a new connection across and maybe our landscape will come up to meet them and that will be their safe access or something. And suddenly you go, wow, that's quite an interesting project. So, and the other way the book is structured is looking at different scales. And I sort of touched upon that with the geography thing, you know, looking at not just the building scale but the neighbourhood, the city and the region and stuff and understanding what things you do where. You know, you start saying, I'm going to create a big flood storage area here. There's not enough space. It might work over here, though. You know, or you might say, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to build a kind of flood defense around here. Well, what are we going to do? Defend every single building? Maybe I'll just put one across the city and I'll deal with it in one go or something. And you can start to think it's all sort of integrated. And then, well, if we could have put a flood defense across here, can we combine it with something else, you know, like the road network? Can we turn it into a beach? You know, it's a nice big structure like that, there's some sand on it and stuff. Right on the waterfront as well, that's a good place for a beach. Um, you know, so you can start to kind of do sort of interesting things with it. Um, and, you know, as I said early on, you know, it's sort of driven by the environmental measures. So you then start to also think about those other measures that come into it as well. Maybe if you, you know, you want to put wind turbines in to make your development more sustainable, you could put them in the floodplain area, you know, put them on coasts anyway. You know, maybe you could use some of that water for um, thermal energy stores and transfers and stuff, maybe you start to think about, well, if you've got more high-risk areas nearby the water, you could actually have uh, a sort of central space like a school or a shopping mall or, you know, a church or something like that that in the event of flood, people can ev evacuate to. So, you know, this is then suddenly, oh, that's quite interesting, it's a key building. You could, where does that go? What's that going to look like? Can you see it from elsewhere? Maybe, maybe a church is a good one because it's got a spire on it and stuff. They just have to have a blue flag or something so people know to, to go to it. So it's all, you know, it all starts to get quite integrated. And you have to deal with other things as well. You know, it's very easy to sort of focus on, on, on flooding. So here we have a sort of idyllic 
you know, ideal river situation here. Um, buildings all nicely set back, bit of floodplain in front of it, some boats and bridges and stuff. Um, so we, we're dealing quite nicely with the flood flows and the flood velocities and stuff like that. But have we thought about the vulnerability I mentioned? How do you get in and out to it if there's a flood? You know, if this is all low lying, all this is wet. Um, what are the building heights like? What are the views and stuff? So it's all going to be integrated. And um, you know, the, you see these sort of suggestions where people say, "Oh, we'll just we'll just raise the access up and we'll create this kind of walkway so that people can get into the buildings in the event of a flood." This Thames meter is actually like that. Thames meter is the um, a site that they use for uh, Clockwork Orange, which is to, to to sort of display this whole kind of idea of dystopia because it was just such a dreadful place. And the reason why it had all these walkways is because it's right next to the river. There's a big flood defence there. If it fails, that whole site's going to flood. It's never flooded. They're pulling it all down, or probably pulled most of it down by now, because the bloody walkways they put in there, you know, to stop it from flooding. So it's a great idea to solve flooding, but you cause a whole lot of other problems with it at the same time. I put this one in because I was so shocked by it, because this is actually a Miralis scheme. I don't know if anyone knows it. I only came across it yesterday, and I went, my God, that is awful. You know, this is like some deck access social housing <laughs> that they've built, and I thought, you know, have we not learnt a little bit about this? You know, that, that actually this isn't, all, you know, isn't a very good solution. Or if you are going to do this, it's going to have to be a lot better than that. You know, there's enough written about the damn stuff. So it's got to be better than both of these two if you're going to solve it. Or it's got to be a bit more integrated. And that's the other good example here. Yeah, you've got a nice deck access into here. So these are nice and safe up here. Oh, right, OK. How do we get into that? Oh, damn it. Oh, I've hurt my leg. Oh, God, ring, ring 999. Oh, no, they can't get to it. They haven't got any canoes at the, you know, the ambulance station. What? That's bad planning. You know, so we're just not very well organised for it. You know, this, is, this is actually what you know, Britain's like. It's like that when it floods. pretty bloody awful. You know, single glazed windows pouring through there and stuff. So you know, we've, got to, we've got to do a bit better than that. So as I said, access is a, it's a bit of an issue. This is um, a bit of technical stuff. Um, Cars start to float when the water gets to about a foot deep. They then become kind of weapons. They uh, float down rivers and, you know, they float through streams and bash into stuff and things like that. Pretty, pretty nasty. Ambulances can do a little bit better than that. You might well get an ambulance driving through about you know, 40 centimetres or so. And a fire truck can get up to about 50 centimetres. Interesting. So maybe we can have a bit of flooding. Can't have it for the cars, you can't drive in and out of there, but maybe actually we can have a sort of access route that, that works with these two, you know, so we can get our safe access and egress in it. We just need to know what the, the flood levels are. And also, this is a real picture, by the way, and, but equally, the other thing about flooding is, of course, you can't actually see what's underneath. And so this one is one where this, this fire truck hit a sinkhole and just dropped right into it. And with the volume of water on the ground, you know, it can actually cause these sort of things to open up and happen. So it does, does require a little bit of careful planning. This is one that um, I did at my old practice, where we had this big site here, two major rivers, um, usual sort of site, you know, mostly all blue on the flood map and things. Um, they wanted to get, what, about 700 ho homes onto it and things. We, we uh, eventually got consent for 670, and our, our solution to it was to... Uh, rather than sort of try and build up and try and protect and defend and stuff, we, see, we said, well, we've got some high ground here, so we'll, keep, we'll put the road along and get our access and egress into it and things. But where we've got these other bits of high ground, we're actually going to dig it out, get rid of it. So we actually, we, the idea was to dig out areas in between, top, top up these bits here to make them a little bit higher so we could increase some of the flood storage in between the, the houses and actually um, you know, raise these ones up and protect them. This whole end is designed to be sat on, on effectively raised pilotes on storage crates and stuff, so you can just drive in there and the water goes on in underneath. And then if it goes over the top of that, because you've got, you know, our engineers and scientists have got their predictions wrong, that we designed all the ground floor level of it so it could actually be protected and could withstand, well, we, we designed it to about a metre and a half, but it, you know, theoretically it should never even need that. But so we, we kind of worked up the detail of this to make sure that actually if, it did, if everything went wrong, and it did really flood, then it'd be safe. And then we had this nice bridge to get us across the higher ground on the other side as well. So we're kind of lots of different things working together. But what's, you know, it looks, it looks quite straightforward, nice terraces of houses and stuff, but when you zoom into the detail on this, we've actually, these are only sort of um, 
uh, eight metre wide streets. So we had to create little muses to try and make sure we use as much little land as possible. So then we couldn't put our cars down there, so we put the cars on the other side. We created these sort of little green streets um, with you know play areas and stuff for people to you know, operate between the houses and stuff. We're suddenly designing a whole kind of you know neighbourhood here. We're actually changing the way you know people might live because of this flood water. And then they get these amazing gardens. So we only have to put uh, five metre deep gardens on any of these units according to our, our planning policy. But we need all this space for water. So suddenly these guys have got little narrow streets, you know, private, intimate, safe spaces with this great big playground out here. You know, so, and it can work with the, the ecology and stuff and we could support the ditches and drain water into it and stuff. And it all started to kind of really work together. And these are a little bit old now, some of these images, but uh, you can sort of see the idea of it. You know, they have these big generous spaces in between it and things. And, you know, whilst you might have your own little private terraces and stuff, this is actually about uh, creating kind of a whole community. You know, people work, a place where you have a shared garden space and you kind of all work together and stuff. And this is the sort of thing that you know, we're, Jessica and I are doing now in our practice. We're doing these sort of shared spaces. We're using them for flood storage and things. And we're, we're sort of experimenting with the idea of those sort of deck access in that communal area. How big should it be? How many people are, are, you know, operate around that? How do you maintain it? What sort of things happen in those spaces? What sort of restrictions do you have? What do they look like? You know, and, and actually trying to really kind of push architecture on a little bit with, with these sort of spaces. And uh, I don't know why these pictures are jumping around so much. It looks like I'm flipping awful at PowerPoint, but uh, um, this is another one here. So again, the same sort of idea. You know, we create this parkland space in the middle of it, and we design our towns around that. So for the majority of the time, it looks like this, but just on a very rare occasion when it's needed, it can take this water and it can deal with it. And we, by excavating these various areas, we could increase kind of wetland areas and things like that. But we could also reduce the flood risk to other people. So by what we were doing is actually gonna make it better for other people in different areas. And then onto engineering. And I'm just gonna show you some interesting pictures and stuff. So this is another uh, idea of the sort of integration of it that where you start to look at the energy infrastructure linking together with our um, sort of play areas and stuff. So we have local play areas supporting, um, you know, the sort of housing and neighborhoods around it. We have um, industrial uses in, in higher vulnerability areas and stuff, but maybe they can um, be linked to our kind of recycling facilities and stuff, so we build communities around those. Uh, as I said, flood defenses become kind of parkland spaces and amenity and things like that. They might have different forms depending on whether by the river to deal with fluvial, flood, uh, yeah, fluvial flooding or whether by the coast uh, to do with tidal or whether they're dealing with surface water. And all these things start to integrate. They have different kind of landscape language around it. And these are just some really cool you know, bits of uh, infrastructure that people have built. So this is a, a massive flood relief channel in Japan, in Tokyo. And it's just, it's like a cathedral. It's just, you know, staggering. It's a very um, old approach in the sense that it's chuck a load of concrete and steel at it and uh, try and, you know, get the engineers to cope with it all. And it's in a way, it's, 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 it's a total anathema to the idea of working with water. This is about just sort of pushing it and getting rid of it and shoving it somewhere else, but it does look pretty amazing. Uh, this one is an example of a, um, a the redesigned uh, sewage system where they've kind of made it into this whole kind of landscape. Um, probably looks better than it, it smells. Oh, no, I shouldn't say that. It'd be fine. It's supposed to be fine. I haven't actually been there yet. And it looks great from space as well. So I always think it's really important these days with Google. Go around and look at the projects you've built. How good do they look on plan? So you never used to get that, but it's great that you can go back and see if they've got a good you know, profile to them. Um, but this is sort of very much about sort of trying to, to work with, you know, the landscaping and things to kind of cope with the wastewater, kind of a boring aspect of what we do. But if you imagine like these sort of things in amongst these kind of silos of development and stuff, it could be really quite interesting. You know, what do you, what do, you do that? Where does the, the lagoons, you know, of the wastewater treatment, where do they become the landscape that you can actually uh, engage with and have parkland space and things in it? And they've started to do things like this in, in, in China actually really well. And this is a great project. This is a, you know, I, I don't, wouldn't say this is so much about integration because it looks completely different to everything else around it, but it's just really cool. And, uh, you know, it's this hydroelectric plant built onto this, uh, it's a river in Germany and things, and it's all sort of designed with the, the fluidity of the water flowing through it and things. So, but they've managed to, you know, keep the, the large 
um, open channel of the river flowing through here. I believe there's supposed to be sort of uh, fish ladders and all that sort of stuff as well, but I just think it looks good. Um, and this is one that I was involved with in Holland, where it was a big kind of flood relief channel that, again, is just not showing up properly, but is effectively about a, a kilometre long. And uh, we worked on the landscape design of this. So as architects, we were asked to get involved in the landscape design. So we then said, why don't we make it into a whole series of rooms and you know, each room has got a different activity in it and things. And then you, you know, occasions you could link them up like an enfilade and you could have them all interconnected and you could do rowing races and things through it. But then you'd start to think about, well, what's this space like here on these two sides? You know, what kind of activity is it? And, uh, and so it sort of changed the way each of the channels and stuff, uh, sorry, each of the edges would work and you know, whether they, how they would kind of cascade down into the water and, and the buildings that would then go beyond it and things. So it was, the idea was that rather than having this island and then this development over here, which they were planning of for about 20,000 20, homes or something like this, we said, just pull it all together as one and then sort of start to think about how these are all interconnected. Anyway, they, they, we, we, they really loved the ideas and ignored all of them and just built a massive engineering channel. But yeah, it's a quite impressive project nonetheless. Uh, various new bridges and stuff. Um, so it was one of those really real missed opportunities to do something so much more than just an engineering channel. But they got cold feet and thought, oh, we, this is safe. We know engineering. That works. You know, let's not try and mess around with it too much. But that's why we've got to get more involved in these things. So then when it comes to the landscape solutions, again, looking at different scales. On the coast, you know, we're not going to start doing playgrounds to deal with water storage and stuff. This is a massive you know, coastal managed realignment to deal with the, the flood risk and try and reduce the, the risk beyond. This is the example, uh, an example of China and Shenzhen where they've developed this whole kind of wetland area. Uh, it's all you know, part of a park system and stuff. Absolutely beautiful project. I'd really, really want to go and see it rather than just look at all the pictures. Um, this is a, a project which I think through a bit of value engineering lost some of its original kind of style and integrity, but it's, it, it still is the right principle, which is about creating a storage area for rainwater, so not river water and stuff, but in Rotterdam, uh, where they created this kind of play area and things, and the water's supposed to kind of rush off different surfaces and things, and you, obviously you don't use it when it's filled up with water, but you know that actually these things are happening around you, and it's all part of our, of our system. And this is at a small scale where, you know, you, you create little um, storage areas, swales and um, reels and things like that as part of your network of landscaping approaches around it. And, and these are just a, a few, you know, examples of the sort of things you might do. And we, we've sort of set out about 20 different measures in the book that you can use, but there's still loads more of them. Um, this is actually, this is actually uh, my house. Um, that's our green roof. So we're doing our little bit. So we've got green roofs on each of the, little pro each of the projects. Then we've got a big attenuation tank here underneath all of this, which, you know, is riddled with pipe work and cables and stuff all around the side of it, trying to squeeze it all in, which is no easy feat. Um, and then we you know, created these, these funny little chambers at the end, which are called drinking policemen to slow the, you know, the, the, any vehicles that might come down there, but sort of absorb water at the same time. Um, and this is one I, I, I used for years. I love this image because you just uh, imagine the, the, the sort of shock when a child sort of says, well, why have you got fish on the poles and stuff like that? It's, uh, well, it's because if the, you know, if the water ever fills up to there, the fish can actually escape and swim off again. I mean, the, 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 the idea that actually that might fill up to that is just frightening, really. But I mean, it shows such a kind of useful feature. Um, this is some of the managed realignment. Really amazing kind of like how our coastline's changing. We all look at a map and we think that's our coast. But of course, it's, you look back over history and it's all over the place, changes. So, same with the river as well, by the way. If you want to see some really cool maps, go and look at the uh, historic maps of the Mississippi. Yeah, they've got these wonderful kind of overlays of these things in different colours as they've changed over the years and stuff. And the, you know, the whole of the Mississippi Delta, the whole of America, is formed by that river carrying sediment, dropping it in and extending and extending further down. And then you can see this weird sort of offshoot that looks like, like a you know, piece of broccoli coming out into the Gulf of Mexico now, which is where they put this, this uh, flood relief channel. And so the sediment you know, builds up in this really artificial, artificial way. It's amazing what you know, we as, as um, you know, humans have done to, to places. And so here, this is in Sussex, where they've started to realign some of the coastline here, create all these wetlands and things like this. 
And uh, it's really interesting because this is something that we've been trying to propose in uh, Littlehampton as part of a kind of whole master plan for redeveloping the, the town there. Um, this is a, an example of um, one which is over in America where they've um, taken this, this creek, they've kind of taken it out from under the ground in a pipe where it was before, like most of our rivers are in this, in London, and they've kind of, what they call, um, they've sort of um, deculverted is the, the name they use, and they basically turned it into this kind of landscape, and they've been doing, doing it in a few places in London as well. Ladywell Park's quite good, the Quaggy River as well is, is quite good. And, and you can sort of see, this is, there's a few examples of when they're actually in flood, but this gives you an example of it. And you can see how they sort of designed it for the water to flow around and create these sort of shapes and stuff. You can imagine you could sort of write a few funny messages in here that will just appear when it rains a lot or something. But, um, and so this is the one in Littlehampton I mentioned. So we were looking at this development site on the edge here. And uh, whilst I said you can't do flood storage on the coast, we had an exception. Of course, you always do. You know, that's what happens when you do a real project. We had a really narrow river mouth. It used to be that wide. It's now that wide. It's just that little bit, about 40 metres wide. It used to be about a kilometre wide. So they put defences all the way along here, built up all these, these uh, coastal defences, trained the river here, so basically they improved the navigation, completely transformed the, the landscape. Really extraordinary, way too expensive to maintain now, um, particularly when there's not that many people living here. So you know, we, when we looked at this and working with engineers and stuff, well, we said, well, what about if we kind of re-naturalise this and maybe in the future this will become the river and this will change and it will flow down through here and then we can kind of redevelop this. This will then become a marina in here, then the river will go through here. We create a new frontage to Little Hampton, um, and then that will actually protect the rest of the town here as well. And then we can use this at the moment to sort of divert water back and forth through here, and we can use tidal turbines to drive this and generate energy. And we did some calculations to work out how many homes we could power from it and stuff. Well, it wasn't that many, but it was, it was a, I think it was about 10% of the energy needs for about 1,000 homes. And it all started to kind of work together, and this created this kind of amazing wetland park, you know, which is, could be this sort of um, exemplar of what you do with the coast. And the, and the benefit, of course, of this is that, um, you know, architects are always criticising for building their way out of problems, but that's exactly what we were saying. Build a load of homes, get them to pay for it, and then, you know, we don't have to pick up the bill for trying to manage and maintain all this, all, all of Littlehampton as a taxpayer. Anyway, of course, they didn't do that. They've spent about £25 million putting in defences on this side to protect Littlehampton, and now they don't know what to do with this, and so they've got to do the same thing again on this side, but they you know, joined up thinking it's never really our strong point, is it? Um, it's still kind of it's still going on going with that one, um, and you never know, it might, might well happen in some guys, and this is the sort of, uh, you know, the idea of what it, what it looks like now. And this is really unproductive farmland anyway, you know, I mean, it's good if you like peas, but you know, as long as they're salty, you know, so edamames or something like that. But you know, this is all kind of groundwater flooding and you know, salt from the sea and stuff coming up here. It's really rubbish, unprotected farmland, and it's just you know, the idea of spending half a million pounds just maintaining this and then forty million pounds to reinstate this in the future. It's just just chucking money away. Whereas actually, if we kind of did this, we could redevelop this whole area here, transform Littlehampton. We could. Um, uh, we could also deal with this you know, contaminated site here as well, and we could have a you know, nice facelift to the town as well, uh, and, cre and create this amazing lagoon as well, which we, you, know, you could have sort of sailing and all sorts of activities and stuff here, and wetlands and salt marsh regeneration and stuff really could be quite an amazing project. Uh, I do keep hoping that will happen. It does keep ticking along. I've been involved in this project for 10 years. That's what it's like working with councils, so... If you want to do projects like this, just get ready for the long haul. <laughs> I'm hoping that by the end of my career, I, I actually get to finish this one. <laughs> oh dear, I don't know what's happening with this. Anyway, so, um, well, you're just getting snippets of it. You know, it's just a picture window into what flooding's about. So this is, this is our place. This is our courtyard at the end of it. You can see we've got these little green strips and green walls and or, you know, planters and stuff like that. All helps a little bit, but really underneath here is this really great big, um, pile of egg crates to store and soak up water. So this is, this is like a, this is a very you know, glorified swimming pool that we will never enjoy. Um, quite expensive too. But it does our little bit to try and help manage the flood water. So if we get a big rainfall event, we should be safe in our place. And we should also reduce a little bit of runoff into the sewage system as well and help people further downstream. 
you can see them you know, putting all this in so you get an idea of the scale of this. And this is just for three houses. So yeah, it was a bit of money and things, but actually if we all did this, we wouldn't have to be paying for super servers everywhere. So, so on to the last bit, the building, the aquatecture part. Um, so the, the other um, book that I've probably most enjoyed doing, and I did probably spent the least amount of time writing, was the metric handbook chapter. It's, a, it's a quite an, a, an honor to be asked to do something for the metric handbook because it's, it's the sort of like the, the Bible that you always sort of, particularly when you're in practice and you've got to look something up and you go, well, how big is a parking bay and what's the gradient of this? And you go and look it up and, you know, you go, gosh, what would I do without the metric handbook? Well, I'd go get new foots, but anyway, that's a different story, which is slightly better. But no, you go to the metric handbook. So when they asked to do the flood, cha uh, flood chapter, I was really kind of excited about that. And what I wanted to get across in that is just the range of options and the approach of doing, you know, to, to deal with things. And, and in a way, I've kind of labelled all the other points first because really, if you can stop the water before it gets to the building, that's the best answer. But there's a lot of interesting work to be done with the buildings too, of course. Um, these are, uh, I guess, kind of six of the different main ways to deal with it, things. Nice, sensible option, that, really. Just build a hill. You know, stick your building on a hill, you're safe. Why don't we all do that? Well, it's a fair question. The problem with that is it's a bit like um, if you have a bath and it's filled with water, and, you know, that's your, that's your floodplain sort of story and stuff, and then you put, like, a brick in it, and then you put a few more bricks in, those are like houses, the water starts spilling out and going elsewhere. That's the problem with building hills everywhere. You build a load of hills and you pass the problem on to someone else and you cause the water level to rise and everyone else suffers from it. So can't do that most of the time. You can do it by the coast, by the way, because it's a tide. And remember, you can't hold the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Mediterranean, the Indian, you know, the South Sea. You can't hold all of them, so you're all right there. But you can't do it anywhere else. So that's a great idea, but doesn't generally work. Um, this one is the one that everyone keeps talking about. This is the most boring one as architects, I'm afraid. Um, but it's probably the most important one as, as homeowners. So you've got your house, you're in the floodplain already, what do I do on it? I'll turn it into an amphibious house. It'll only cost me half a million pounds. Uh, my house is worth 150,000. Probably won't do that. No, I'll just elevate it up. That's also pretty expensive. Not going to happen. Oh, and the planners won't let you raise it up anyway because everywhere else is bungalows. So, so they end up doing, the, dealing with these measures and stuff. And I have done some of this, and I've got a few pictures to show you of it. Um, but it's, it's not very exciting. And they always tend to paint them in really awful colours just to show you how crap your house will look by the time you've put this horrible flood stuff on it and things. There's a lot of work to be done to make that a bit better, but sorry, excuse my language. This is the usual one, elevate it up. Great idea, I've got some great pictures of that as well. well we've, we've had that one example in Thamesmead, but there's a, lot of, a load of other ones as well. It's, it's really good I, I, idea generally, you know, because you raise it above the flood level, uh, as long as you get your flood level right. And how high is, how high is acceptable? You know, when do you stop raising up? You know, how, what, otherwise you can just build everywhere. And you can see our staircase nicely coming down into the water as well. So we know the problems with that one. Uh, amphibious property, it's basically a floating property that sits on the ground and just floats when it needs to. But there is a good rationale for an amphibious property over a floating one. One is it's not in the middle of the river normally and stopping the water from flowing, so you put it on the ground. It can deal with pretty high water levels, uh, often certainly higher than these ones. Um, and the other thing is that because it sits on the ground most of the time, you can make it heavier than this one. And that's, and, and well, well, great, why do I want to make a heavy building? Because it's bigger. <laughs> and people want big buildings, you know. If you have to spend a lot of money to build a little, you know, uh, sort of caravan on a, a floating pond, pontoon, not many people are going to do it. I know that because I've only done one so far. But actually, and well, I've only done one of these as well, to be fair. But uh, you know, they're all expensive. But um, but you know, this this has got some mileage in it as well. So there's there's the, uh, the land raising one in Holland. You know, great image on a nice mound and stuff. Looks really good. Can't do too many of those, as I said, because before you know it, you push the water everywhere. And you can see an example of as these things are getting worse, water levels starting to rise, it's starting to go out there. You know, one day it's probably going to get to that point, and they go, "Damn it, we need to make a bigger hill." You know, maybe they'll just move, put another one next door and just move the church onto that or something. This is the flood resilient one. I only have one slide on it because, as I said, it's the most boring architectural one. Very important. But, yeah, don't, 
really worry too much about it when you're a student, I would say, unless you really want to get into it, deal with it afterwards. But these are the sort of things that you can do. Flood resilient doors, um, you know, windows and stuff that have all seals and stuff on it. It's all about the detail on this. It's all about things like the brickwork and creating <coughs> waterproof cavities in between the two courses and stuff, having pumps to drain things away afterwards, having special, you know, membranes and stuff on the ground and things like that. And, uh, you know, it's quite nice to see it on country fire, to be honest with you, and see them when they came and blasted it with water and, and know that it works and things. Um, but I haven't shown you any pictures of the inside of it because they made it look really horrible. <laughs> um, and then this is some of the, the uh, elevated ones, kind of classic example down by the river course. You know, really amazing to sort of see this one in pictures. Uh, this is actually an old tutor of mine um, years ago. And uh, where he, he, he got the right idea, he's built it up and things. Probably they, you know, they, they weren't there when the flood occurred, I hope. Uh, and, you know, seems to have done very well, protected it, kept it safe. This is a nice example where you can use the space underneath, build over the water, put your boats underneath it and stuff. Just make sure that if the water level goes up, you move your boat out, otherwise it's going to be more like a raft. Um, and then this is a classic one, isn't it? I did say I'd come back. Actually, I think I said Frank Lloyd Wright, it's Road, but anyway. So this is, a, this is a classic one, isn't it? You know, Farnsworth House, a very elegant solution, you know, beautiful piece of architecture, designed to work with flooding, you know, so when the water level comes up and stuff, you know, the building's uh, elevated out of it, you know, safely. Oh, hold on a second. We've got our water level wrong. That's not good, is it? You know, it, looks, it looks a bit more grounded now than it is as well. It's lost that lovely floating elegance of it. Get your flood level wrong, it's not great. Yeah, it's a real problem. So that, that, you know, th this is a real game changer when all of the predictions, all these kind of levels that we've been working to in the past are starting to, to move and change. And I've had a project where even during the project, the flood level has actually gone up by half a metre. You know, you think, flipping heck, if that's happened now, what, what are they going to tell us in five, ten years' time? You know, so when we designed the amphibious house, we, we sort of designed it to the flood levels they told us, and then we added about a metre tolerance onto it, you know, which is total overkill. But we just thought, let's just make sure we get this one right, because, you know, again, don't want to look back at the end of the career and, you know, see this great big heavy amphibious house come floating off and careening down the river, because, you know, a car weighs about a tonne, the amphibious house is 250 tonnes. That's a bloody nuclear missile going down the river. <laughs> Oh, and this is a great example of getting your levels right. So they, they, they have really been thinking about it. It looks like they might have even extended it, you know. Get, get it right, keep raising up and stuff like that, yeah. Can't see any social problems with that one whatsoever at all. I forgot the milk. Right, go on, off you go, back out again. Yeah, as you imagine the whole kind of city of this, it just keeps getting higher and higher. And then there's a plan that's saying, well, you're only allowed one story. Oh, it's okay if I can have one story as long as it's three stories up in the air. <laughs> and unfortunately, that is an example of, you know, th these are designed to FEMA standards in America. This is designed to be hurricane proof and things like that. And then this is an example of what happened after a hurricane. Um, not many left. You know, it, it, it's, it's really quite serious that, that you, whatever you're designing to these standards is getting those standards right or just designing in a different way. Maybe they probably have to realize that maybe it's not necessarily the right place to do it or certainly not the way, right way to build things. And, you know, I've looked at these sort of situations and, and, and thought, well, the, the, the trick to this is you've got to allow water to pass through. And I can see they've done that with these stilts and stuff, but clearly actually getting them stable enough, maybe bringing them together, linking them together, making them strong enough, designing towns around it is perhaps a better way to think about it. Um, and this is, this is one that um, uh, I've, I've done before. This is an illustration. It hasn't flooded. It shouldn't flood like that, I hope. But you know, it's, it's a really subtle intervention where it's only just elevated a little bit. We're pr much more confident about it because it's much smaller. It's just off a brook, so it's not at risk from a major river. Still risk, but you know. And what we were able to do is to sculpt the landscape so that we've got a safe and dry access and egress on the other side of the house. And it kind of cants across uh, onto this side so that we just have a, a, a little level difference here, excuse me, um, that can actually. Uh, cope with the water and it should it should never flood but we just raised it up a bit just so that it can it can deal with it if we, if we can and we tried to make it part of the theme with a sort of deck floating above it and things like that and uh, it's worked quite well and this is another one um, I've done which you know didn't really even realize it was at risk of flooding until we started designing it and uh, this is over in Hackney Wick and uh, you, you think well you're going to check it because it's next to a canal but a canal is not a river so it's not carrying a lot of flows 
but then it connects with the River Lee over here, and that is a river, so there was our problem. So when we actually looked at it, the flooding was not going to come from the canal, it was going to come from the other side of the site. Really just weird kind of stuff that you don't expect. So we're designing for flooding that comes from that side, even though there's a flipping water course right in front of us, but that's never going to affect us. And so actually the water was coming from this side, and we had to design the building to be kind of elevated up, but we, we, we wanted to try and do this so that it had uh, multiple functions. So in this case, it's actually, um, it was providing the kind of ventilation for uh, the gas um, membrane and stuff because it was a contaminated site. And then we also wanted to create this, this foyer space on the top that would actually provide a kind of access route from the canal and the event, you know, that, that people coming down from the River Lee that does flood, they could actually get onto here and be safe. And we also created a link block that connected to the other blocks so that those buildings, which weren't designed to be flood resilient, they could actually come out of there and come onto this building right next to the canal, which is safe from flooding. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. And this is the, um, the one that I said that I've done a floating house where um, by, you know, it was really interesting because we, we had to, the most interesting part of this is not so much even the flooding, it's actually the way in which we had to build it. So we designed it so that it was all prefabricated, SIPs panels and stuff. The height of this is exactly the limit we could get on the back of a lorry, as they say, with a low loader on it. And then we could use that to kind of create the height of the space and create a little mezzanine floor in here. And what we really wanted to do is to try and make it as open as possible. So we're in here, you get a little view out towards the sky, you get a view across the water, you see the water on, on all these sides. And to try and make this have a sort of deck feel inside. So even though we didn't have a, a deck on the outside of it, you'd pull back the doors and the windows and yeah, arguably you could fall into the water, but you know, you could fall into the water if you're on a boat. So it's sort of reasonable. And um, you could dangle your feet out and put, you know, put your feet in the water and stuff. And this is another, you know, just a beautiful example that um, just had to include in here. So they kindly gave us permission to use, use their image in our, in our book. So, so a few more things just to talk through. Amphibious House, that's the one we're most well known for. It's um, you know, a nice kind of simple kind of um, building with a pitch roof and stuff. We had to kind of keep it quite sane because <coughs> it's in a conservation area on an island, very sort of sensitive uh, setting. Um, the height was restricted, so we couldn't go any higher than this. Um, the site was restricted uh, because it's, uh, here it is, you can see the, um, the old house actually here. And uh, you see, see that one there? And uh, quite close to the river edge here, quite a narrow little site here. And effectively, we couldn't, <coughs> excuse me, we couldn't obviously go any wider than the site, much as I you know, always said about extending the red line boundary, there is realities when people own bits of land. Um, so we had, to, we, we had to sort of try and fit this whole house on it, and the, and the client wanted um, to increase their little bungalow that they bought, which is, what, 80 square metres, to, to a three-bedroom house and, you know, all mod cons and stuff. So we've trebled the size of it, and the only way we're going to do that is to put three floors on it. So how do you put three floors on it? We've got to raise it. We can't go up any higher than the boundary, and the flood level's like this, so we've actually only got one floor left, and we thought, well, we'll, we'll go down. And this is our opportunity to do it. We already had come up with the amphibious house thing, and there's examples of it elsewhere as well. So this is our chance to do it. This is, this is the right site to do it on. And that's absolutely right. It's the right solution for this site. It's going to deal with the flooding. Um, it's you know, a perfect solution. We don't increase any risk elsewhere. We actually create a bit more storage because we've got a hole in the ground and things like that. Um, oh, bugger. It's on an island which has got no vehicle access whatsoever. And we've got to get all, all our materials across to create the, uh, a first in the UK that's never been done before. And we're, we're exploring kind of new ways of kind of constructing it. And we, we can't even get a lorry to the site. It was a, it, that was the hardest thing. The technology to make the house work was simple. It's just Archimedes principle. You know, you get your buoyancy right and it, and it will float. The hardest bit was to actually get access to the site. So that's a good, that's a good map. It's an unusual sort of site I've had to deal with over the years. You know, you want one like over here, but actually it's normally in the middle of the blue and all the things I told you about planning, you just can't do. So we have to work out, we have to look through all the architectural solutions. And there you go, that's the house before. See raised up like the Farnsworth house. Flood level's gone up a little bit since they, they did that one. So we, you know, we had to build within this in one story. So the only way we could do it was to build down. Um, and to do that, it, it, was quite, it was interesting because it was, it's sort of simple and um, complex at the same time. It's in, in a way that the simplicity of it is you basically dig a hole in the ground and you put a house like, like it has a basement. And instead of it being held into the ground, which is what you normally want when you 
you're in a water table and the house wants to float, we wanted to make it float. So all we had to do is to build the basement for it, but make sure it doesn't connect to it. But we still had to make sure it connected to it, because if it didn't connect to it, it would jiggle around and float off, you know, when the water would come and just disappear off down the river. So, so the sort of components we have are this floating base, which is basically just made out of concrete, which again doesn't sound right, you know, but it's, it's like a bathtub floats in, in water if it's outside because it's filled with air. Um, then we have these four posts on the side, which are called dolphins, which I think is kind of interesting. They're basically guide posts to, to secure it from going, you know, to allow it to go up and down. And we, we had to shape the building around them to make sure that it wouldn't jig around a bit as well, you know, because actually it's a bloody heavy building and, you know, if it doesn't land in the right place, it's going to be pretty awkward. Um, and then the, uh, uh, the, we had the wet dock for it to actually sit in. So this is a key part that goes with the, um, with the base. And this took quite a long time for our client to accept that this had to be wet, you know, because this was not a sea. It's not holding back the Atlantic Pacific, the Mediterranean, the Southern Seas and the China Sea. Let's see if I can get one more in next time. Um, but this is, this is about trying to hold back the river. Sorry. So, you know, actually, if you just built this and you can't try to keep it dry and you've got a massive river right next to you, it's not going to work. It's just going to cost you a fortune if you do try and do it. So we said this is a wet dock. And, the, and the, what's interesting about this is this doesn't float by virtue of the river overtopping. We actually wanted the water to come in through here because the, the slower the water came in here and the, coming up from below would actually make the building more stable. Because instead of it rushing across like a wave, like the ones I showed you with the hurricane, where the buildings just, they're all raised up and they just fall over. You know, we want it to rise up nice and slowly, controlled. So we actually di you know, directed the water in through here. I mean, when I say directed, we basically made it perforated so the water would come up through here. And as the river rose, the water inside would rise and the house would then go with it. And I know it worked because we tested it a couple of times to, you know, to make sure, because we just, particularly it was, gonna, it was on TV, we really wanted to make sure it worked and you know, not, not be the end of our careers quite early on. So as I said, these are the sort of various parts that go into it. And the last one, <coughs> which probably took the, one of the most workings out was the flexible utility connections. You know, and um, you know, people always ask, well, how did you make it work? And basically we had to use flexible pipes. And so what we had to do is, remember I said that we designed it so that it could work, it could cope with a 1.8 metre flood level, and we added a bit more. I slightly exaggerated, we designed it to 2.5 metres, which is well above what we, we needed to. But that meant that these pipes that connect across have to move with it as well. So we meant we, we had to plot the travel distance, so in rest, to make sure that it didn't snag, you know, as the building goes and it you know, goes up and then they go down and sits on the pipes, that would be bloody annoying. You know, the building would go down wonky for a start and then, you know, you wouldn't be able to get it up again until you could get water into that, so, you know, pump it in or something. So we had to, so we had to design those so the pipes wouldn't get caught up and snag in it, but couldn't be held and restricted to it. So it's, it's all about this kind of, like, distance between them and the, the travel of these to, to plot them in the most extreme case. Um, and then as a final measure, um, just to make sure the building doesn't float off, we would try to get the level of this surrounding here and the depth of the concrete to match so that the, you know, it wouldn't actually go outside of the base. So if the steel post failed and broke or whatever, that it would still be held within that base and it couldn't float away. And that was quite interesting because as a cost saving, we had to, we wanted to save some money on it. So we reduced the, um, the depth of this to reduce the weight of it, which meant we had to keep ch adjusting all of these little sectional levels. In fact, um, the details for it. So you can see how it works here, you know, water, water going up at the same time as the river. And this, was the, this section we worked on loads of times, <laughs> trying to get this balance right between the depth of this and when it would float. Uh, to make sure we were happy with it, and equally the access as well, because we wanted to know, uh, you know, what point the water level was and when it would start to float, so that we'd get the right number of steps up to it and stuff to make sure that it didn't float too early and you couldn't get into your house. You know, which it sounds stupid, but actually the water could be here, and the building floats, and there's no flooding, so you could have your building floating, and even though there's no flooding, you can't get into it. <laughs> so. That's quite, quite interesting. And of course, then when we were doing it, we had the worst flood in 60 years. So, as I said, you know, this is something we had to wait. We just had to wait until it ended. There's nothing we could do. They get stuck there in the water. Nothing we could do. Can't get it off. You know, we had to use a chain ferry to get the, the stuff on, on, on the cross. We had to design everything in short spans. In fact, that was the biggest thing we could get on was these steels. 
everything else had to be done spliced together and stuff. So we had to change the whole way we designed the building just so that we could get it onto the site. And you can see there, there we are testing it, pumping water into it to make sure it works and stuff, and, you know, and make sure that water didn't, water didn't come in. We got enough water going in the dock, but not enough, no water going in the house. You know, and at, in the end, we tried to design it so it had this sort of nautical references, you know, with the, the zinc, you know, which is used to stop boats rusting and stuff, and then using these sort of this, the shiplap, uh, sorry, not shiplap, the um, uh, shingle tiles on the outside of it so that, it, you know, it looks kind of domestic, but at the same time it has a sort of slightly kind of scaly look to it and things. And, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it looks, looks like a house and it has these terrific views across the water, of course. Uh, and then I think the final one I was just going to mention is just the raw dots. I'll just skip through this, but you know, when, when you are looking at kind of floating and water space and stuff, that my favourite idea on this one was the idea that we create a, um, a floating village and uh, we didn't win the competition in, in the end. Um, and the, the competition winner was actually docked right against the edge, which, I, which we said fundamentally was the worst thing you could do, was to build along the edge of this and to just sort of extend normal buildings out into the water. How boring is that? You know, build a, build a floating village in the middle, make it like Venice, make it something special. And, and then you put a periphery around it, which is this, this water space you get this interaction between the buildings in the water and the buildings on the land and the spaces in between it. And we talked about this being like a blue belt, like the green belt as a protected space and a play area around it and stuff. And, um, and you could extend it on and it come this sort of chainage of all these things kind of flowing through the water course and, you know, like the rooms we talked about in Nijmegen and this stuff. And it could be something really special that you kind of, you could get, you know, married here and you could go off on a boat and you could go round into this big water park in the area. We had a pub in the middle because we thought, you know, Village Green's got to have a, got to have a pub. So, well, Village Blue's got to have a pub. But our pub can move. So, you know, if you want a sunny spot, you just move it across there. And then, you know, and you could float it around and stuff. And when it's winter time, you might pull it over to the corner so it's a little bit less windy and things. We'd have liked to have more, but we thought that was a bit, getting a bit carried away. We thought we can have one movable building in this at least. Um, and then, you know, each of these little villas and chalets onto the water side of things, and then the sort of extension starting here and becoming a marina. And, and we, we looked at all the spaces, and we really got into this idea of what, how big a water space should it be? You know, how wide is the water channel? How wide is the space next to it? And we looked at, you know, Venice and other canal places and stuff to try and design a language for the urban planning for it, which, because there isn't an example of this, you know. I'm not a very good one, anyway. Um, oh, does that work? Let's see if it's going to work. Well, that's, that's obviously the floating village at night. Um, it's not a space that you want to go to. You know? the, the <coughs> I'll, uh, I'll see if I, if I press play on this. Oh, there you go. Yeah, brilliant. And it was quite an interesting project because we, you know, we, 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 you could actually approach it from the cable car, from... Uh, you know, from, from boat, by water taxi or something like that, by, by road, by rail from the Dockland Light Railway, and of course by air from the, uh, from the airport nearby. And we thought it's got to look good from all angles. So again, that's why we kind of like the idea that it's not just an extension, but it's actually it's, its own entity in its own right. And that, yeah, it's a bit kind of Dubai to have a shape from the space, uh, from above, and we didn't want to kind of oversell that idea too much, but we thought, you know, well, Boris was mayor at the time, we thought he'd like that sort of thing. <laughs> But, you know, you could see the idea of this kind of water space. And we had to sort of work out all the kind of levels to sort of create these, these um, bridges over it and stuff. So we created terraces down into the water that would then allow you to get high enough over so you could get boats in and out of it so you could come. Because whilst we've got a pedestrian access across it, we thought the fun bit would be really getting a boat and rowing out to the, uh, to the island. And then looking at kind of what it might be like at night and these sort of interactions of space and stuff. And I think the key thing with water is that everyone always thinks of water is this kind of untouchable big expanse and stuff but the the way we sort of plan and we think about the way we plan our towns is not just we just have everything around big parks we've got different spaces you know we've got you know, this hierarchy of spaces and the same thing applies to the water you know it, it, water planning has got to be take the eye the way in which we would think about planning for for architecture to water but we seem to forget it for some reason um, and then finally, this is the sort of things we're working on now. So taking these ideas of these sort of shared courtyard spaces and looking at how you know, these buildings interact with it. And so whilst the flood risk isn't a priority here in South London, you know, we're still providing attenuation tanks. We're still looking at how the 
you know, water's collected and changes the landscape a little bit. You know, so every little project can have a bit of water in it and to, to do something kind of special. So, and you can see the rainwater harvesting collection facilities. This is going crazy on this one. And uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know what's happened with those ones there. But again, you know, a, a little bit helps, you know, green roofs on here, building up into the boundaries and making the architecture, making it holistic. So it's all about all those different things kind of coming together. So even when you're not dealing with water, you're still a, an opportunity to kind of bring it into it. So thank you very much for your time. I guess I, I should ask if there are any questions. Fantastic, everyone knows everything about it now. <laughs> Shall I ask you a question as a test of your learnt it? At what level does a, a fire engine float? How, how deep is, is the water? Oh, we have a winner over here. <laughs> have, you, have you tested the, 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 the Are you talking about the amphibious house? Yes, amphibious. Well, it, it, we tested it um, in the summertime at first. So once we built the, the can float base, we, that's when we really wanted to test it because you know, there's a lot of work gone into that. If you get that bit wrong and then you build the whole house on top of it, it's a bit of a waste of money. So we, we tested it then and we pumped the water into it to, just to lift it up enough to make sure that, that one, it was, it was going to float, wasn't going to leak, wasn't going to suddenly find the concrete sat on the ground and the walls came up. So we, you know, so we tested it there. And we also wanted to test the mechanism, the gear, you know, the, the, the glides for it to kind of go up and down on the, on the side of these uh, posts. Um, and, um, and, but we didn't, you know, we didn't sort of tend extend it to the full, excuse me, to the full height it could go to, but just, just enough to know it would work. And then when it was finished, we did a second flood test. So this was, um, I was actually there at the time. Um, we were, we were, you know, arranged for the flood test, and the, I think I think the, the film crew might have been there as well. And uh, it was it was interesting because the engineer Technica, who, who'd done all the kind of clever part of working all this out, they they sort of worked out all the weight of it and stuff, and we told them everything was going into rooms, and we you know tried to you know do all the maths and so on. We got there, we put all this pig iron weight into the base to to keep the ballast to try and get it all level and stuff. Wasn't enough. <laughs> so for some reason it was wrong, but we had to put. Another, uh, another, what was it, about 1,500 kilos or something stupid like that of blocks into it. And there was, uh, there was uh, you know, armies of us carrying in. So we were, it was twisted. It was twisting. We didn't get, it wasn't balanced. And I don't know why, it must have been something wrong in the calculation or something like that. Um, and this is quite often, quite often the case with floating buildings, even boats, they call it trimming it. And that's what we were doing. We were trimming the house to try and get it level. And because there were about 15 of us there, we all stood at the end, we're like, right, okay, so five people at the end of the house, you know. Then we, and Matthew was going around measuring it to see what the alignment was like and, you know, against the guideposts and stuff. And then we got to basically all of us were like, yep, we got it level, that's it, get all the blocks in there. And we were just lugging blocks into this uh, corner to try and get it, get it leveled out and stuff. And um, so we, we planned the flood test to do this. And, uh, and it was uh, the, the, the guys had organized these pumps, the pump didn't work, so they, they, they had a second backup pump. That didn't work. And we thought, bloody hell, we're running out of time. We're all here for the day here to get this done. And then, and then it was winter time anyway, and lo and behold, the river was coming up. <laughs> and it just happened to be the highest point of, of, of the river at the, at the time. And so it was, it was enough to get the building to float. We didn't need the pumps anyway. So, you know, we were able to do our test and, uh, and know that it worked. But we, since, since then, we've, we, the clients actually used it quite a few times to sh show off to his mates, and he kind of pumps water into it to kind of show, look at my house moving, moving up and down. Well, you mean if you get... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's amazing, actually, how, how much water we had to pump out all the time during the works. And it was, you know, we had these massive pumps, but when it was actually just pumping it to fill it up and stuff, it was, it was fine. But yeah, we were actually, the planners were quite worried about the, um, the, uh, the height of it. And they said, um, well, how long is it going to be up in the air? And, you know, it's going to be higher than all the other buildings when it's flooding. <laughs> that is the least of your concern. When this building is floating a meter above all the others, you've got flooding everywhere. You've got a lot more things to be worried about. <laughs> this house doesn't quite fit within your planning policy at that time. <laughs> 
It was just crazy. But because nobody had ever done anything like this before, we had to basically educate the environment agencies so they knew what it was. And we, we were lucky in the sense that there were other examples of it in the world. Okay, not the same. They were basically generally all above ground. So ours was so, somewhat different. But we could actually show them that it had been done and it worked. Um, and we had to sort of provide loads of information to them. You know, so, and of course, you know, you provide them all this technical information. They didn't come back with a single question. So I think they had no idea what they were looking at. <laughs> And we even had to do a kind of a maintenance regime as well to explain, you know, how we were going to do it, what the periods of maintenance. So we, we wrote our own maintenance plan to said, you know, there would be visual inspections every year, you know, there'd be, uh, you know, so we had a, and you'd have to do a test each year as well to test it. And then you'd do every five years, you'd pump all the water out of it so you could go, or something like that. I can't remember the detail, but we had to do this sort of maintenance regime for it as well. Well, to be honest, with you, I, I, I obviously realised that was the most boring part of my lecture. Um, is at the beginning, what I was saying is that when I first got into it, I was started to, you know, um, well, Richard and I, partner at the time, we were looking at this and we were sort of saying, well, what what are we going to do that, you know, at the end of our career, we're going to be be proud of? And we was, we were looking at environmental measures, and we both, you know, had been brought up in education, understanding that you need to think about renewables and reducing emissions and all that sort of stuff. And, but it was all well and good, kind of all this sort of um, uh, these sustainability measures. But we just, we soon, as we started doing that, we realized that we, whilst that may well be the case, we weren't going to get there quick enough. And even if we built all of our new homes to zero carbon, it doesn't solve all the homes we've already got. And so we're still going to end up pumping energy into the system and still going to end up with the climate rising and, you know, Several years have gone since then, and it's pretty evident that we're no, not going to hit any of our targets anyway. So you've got to look at what are the, the consequences of it. And there are lots of people looking at kind of overheating and uh, you know, increased wind velocities and stuff like that. But the most obvious one to us was flooding. You know, it was a really big subject. Well, I suppose in a way, well, so they're all just some form. Well, we didn't do the engineering, um, but we worked very closely with somebody. Yeah, I mean, there was a project I ran, um, a research project I ran called the Life Project, um, and. One of the most interesting parts of that was, and this was before the amphibious house, um, was that I set up this, this, this brief and the structure of how we were going to kind of run the project and the kind of different stages we had to do it, you know, because I'd never done a research project before. I thought, better well, try and work out what we do before we get started on it. And, um, and the, one of the first exercises I did was this workshop that I ran, and I basically just tried to get everyone to forget everything they already knew about stuff because it was, um, wasn't until we could kind of get people to drop their preconceptions that you could start to think afresh. And it was really invigorating because that's where the project in Littlehampton came out of and uh, other projects as well. But you know, the, the, we, we could start to do that. And actually, things like the Amphibious House, they've come out of those sort of research and exploratory work and things where we've sort of gone, oh, well, what about if we do this instead? You know, and then and you just, when you find someone else who's like-minded who's willing to, to, to try it and give it a go, then uh, as we did with Technica, you know, then it, it was really enjoyable, actually. And, uh, and it, it, there isn't a clear division between the architecture and the engineering. And, you know, really, a best architecture or the best engineering shouldn't have a clear division either. It should be that kind of complete embrace of the two because you then get these, you know, amazing kind of um, solutions that, that are both elegant and, you know, efficient in their, in their engineering but also beautiful and, you know, conceptual in their architecture. <laughs> That was obviously I was droning on at that point. <laughs> yeah, go for it.